Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's program. I'm Erin Greenwald, Vice President of Public Programs at the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and Editor-in-Chief of 64 Parishes Magazine. I'm delighted to kick off the 2021 season of Bright Lights Online, conversations with 2021 Humanities Awards winners. For the last 36 years, the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and the LEH's Humanities Awards have honored the culture bearers, humanists, filmmakers, photographers, and now podcasters who provide access to and interpret Louisiana history and culture. We are proud to share their stories and explore their contributions on select Fridays in June and July through Bright Lights Online. The full schedule of all six programs is available at leh.org. We hope to see you in the coming weeks for a rich series of conversations with some fascinating folks. And later this year, we look forward to celebrating the life and work of John T. Scott, the posthumous recipient of the LEH's highest honor, Humanist, Humanist of the Year, when we open the Hellas Foundation John Scott Center on the first floor of our headquarters in New Orleans. To launch the 2021 season of Bright Lights Online, we'll be discussing season four of the Slate Slow Burn podcast which won the LEH's inaugural Best in Digital Humanities Award. This award recognizes publicly accessible digital humanities projects that bring new insights to, or significantly improve the public's understanding of the state, its history, and its culture in all of its good and bad ways. In six hour long episodes, Slate Slow Burn podcast and host Josh, Josh Levine explore the life of notorious white supremacist and former Louisiana politician, David Duke. Joining us to discuss the making of the podcast and its subject matter are Joshua Levine, Christopher Johnson and interviewer Larry Powell. Today's conversation is being recorded and streamed live via Facebook using Zoom webinar. If you have a question you'd like answered during the question and answer period, please find the Q&A function, the little button at the bottom of your screen, not the chat window, but the Q&A button, and type your question in there. We've reserved 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the conversation for audience questions. We have also enabled closed captioning for today's program. To activate closed captions on your personal device, Locate the closed caption icon marked CC in your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen, click it and select show subtitles. And now I'm delighted to welcome our guests for today's program. Josh Levine is the host of Slate's podcast, Slow Burn, David Duke, the recipient of the LEH's 2021 Best in Digital Humanities Award. Levine is Slate's national editor and co-hosts the co-hosts the sports podcast, Hang Up and Listen. He's the author of The Queen, The Forgotten Life Behind an American Myth, which won the 2019 National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography. Before joining Slate, he wrote for the Washington City Paper. Levine is a native of New Orleans, we're really proud to claim him, and he graduated from Brown University. Christopher Johnson is producer of Slate's podcast, Slow Burn, David Duke, which was also, as you know, the recipient of the Best in Digital Humanities Award. Johnson is supervising producer of the 99% in Invisible podcast, co-host co of the award-winning podcast, The Realness, and host of the Audible original series, 100 to 1, The Crack Legacy. He's reported and produced for NPR, WNYC, PRI, KCRW, Marketplace, and Jazz Night in America, among others. Johnson is a native of DC and lives in New York City, and he has warned us that we may hear New York City traffic outside of his window during this presentation. Larry Powell, who will be moderating today's conversation, was the 1999 LEH Humanist of the Year. For more than three decades, he taught history at Tulane University, where he also served as director of the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South. Powell has a large body of publications, including Troubled Memory, Anne Levy, The Holocaust, and David Dukes, Louisiana. Welcome to all of you. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, to, to me, it's a real pleasure and honor to be invited to moderate this conversation because quite frankly, when I started hearing uh, the podcast, I wasn't quite sure that I would learn anything new. Uh, having been immersed in this, as, this story as anyone who's lived through it can attest. But uh, I learned uh, quite a number of new things. And uh, it's really, I think, a, I've listened to about three or four of the, of the 
seasons of a slow bird. And I may be prejudiced, but I do think this one is at the head of the class. And, and I'm wondering, uh, both Josh and Christopher, that maybe, maybe we should start by giving kind of a thumbnail sketch of what it's about, because there's a whole trajectory here, beginning with this guy, career, David Duke's career, sort of being in the dumpster, and then he reinvents himself. And the man in the hour meet when uh, when Louisiana, especially New Orleans, are is in kind of a both a moral and economic crisis, and and the rest is history. But I think it, it'd be fascinating to hear how both of you and we'll sort of sum up this story. Not that we want to, uh, you know, have any spoiler alerts, but still, I think it's it's it might be be helpful for uh, <clears throat> those who are just coming into this story. Maybe not heard it or heard about it, but I think it'd be interesting to know from your own mouth how what it was about. That's the good thing about history, Larry, is that you don't have to give a spoiler alert because uh, sorry, we already know what what happened. No, no, but, not always. <laughs> um, it's a real honor and pleasure to be with both of you guys and Larry. Your work was so important to us in making this series, both in in terms of providing just important context and background, but also just being an inspiration in terms of the kind of work that we wanted to be doing. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you for moderating today. So the reason I was interested in this story was that I grew up with it and grew up around it. I was um, you know, between eight and 11 years old during David Duke's political rise in Louisiana in the late 80s and early 90s. And what I knew of him was that he was this formidable political figure in my home state, that he was somebody who um, from, you know, first in District 81 in Jefferson Parish, um, and then using that as a perch to run for the US Senate, in the governor's race, who was a really um, kind of powerful and alluring figure to a lot of people in the state, and one who I was, as a child, very kind of confused and scared by. And so as now an adult and a journalist, I wanted to understand both that period better and what happened and why and how it happened, but also who Duke was beforehand, um, his time in the Klan, his kind of flirtation with Nazism and Nazi rhetoric and beliefs. And so for me, this was kind of a learning process and an educational process. And I know Christopher, you came to the story with a little bit of a different background and knowledge base than I did, if you wanted to speak to that. Yeah, right on time as the traffic uh, kicks up a little bit out there. Um, I, I just want to echo uh, the thanks to, to you, Larry, and to the endowment you know, for, for doing this. This is a, such a great opportunity, I think, to kind of talk about, go inside of the work that we've done and very much inspired by, by your work. And so, um, I mean, the only thing I'd really add is that, you know, I'm reminded, I've gone back and listened since we made the series last summer, and I'm reminded also, in addition to telling the story of, of David Duke's rise, all of the lots of the different people um, that he impacted, not like politically and also the kind of cultural social stuff, which I found super interesting. It's so kind of inside Louisiana in a way that I'd never been when it came to David Duke's story. So meeting all of these different folks who he encountered and who encountered him along the way and came away with all these different interpretations and trying to piece that together to create this sense of who who he was and how he was affecting folks so it's like it's both of i think it's a it's both of those things like that political story but also that very kind of human experience that that shapes the sort of trajectory of of who we know as david do well it's safe to say that you both have captured that in a, in a very poignant way um uh, you know i was struck uh josh when you went back to forsyth county and revisited Duke's uh, really kind of inaugural national uh, racist tour. And Forsyth County, of course, is where uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is from, as I know. Isn't that, is that the county that she's representing in 
in Congress right now? I believe that's the case, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what made you decide to go back and begin there? Is it because his career, as you suggest, may have been cratering and this is a desperate attempt to uh, <clears throat> rejuvenate it? Or? So Duke was always very attuned to the kind of issues of the moment. And he did have what you're referring to in Forsyth County came in the mid 1980s, but he had this earlier career in the 70s as a Klansman where he was trying to kind of, I don't know if rehabilitate is the right word, but definitely rebrand the Klan as a more kind of modern iteration of this longstanding racist white supremacist organization, you know, at times wearing a suit, but at times also wearing the robe and the hood. Um, but being this like kind of young, fresh face of racism and hatred. And he had some degree of success with that in the 70s, but I think ultimately realized that there was gonna be a ceiling on his popularity. And he had always, you know, he had run for office in Louisiana multiple times in the 70s. And I think had always had a kind of political ambition and being an active Klansman and wearing that robe and hood um, did I think put a limit on his popularity. And so he kind of, you know, went away from that, formed the National Association for the Advancement of White People and tried to disassociate himself from the, the Klan and make his um, arguments be more around equality and fairness and developing a sort of like identity politics or race consciousness of, of whiteness. And what happened in Forsyth County in the 80s is that he found a kind of new currency and excitement around that idea um, and around, you know, the, the, the sort of activism there was around this basically all white county wanting to remain that way and Duke and the Klan kind of seizing on that and you know basically using it as a springboard for this new political career of his and basically you know rebranding himself like he'd done in the 70s and finding um, a new kind of energy and excitement around that idea in the 80s that did actually lead to springboard of political success that he hadn't seen before. And a model for the kind of racial apartheid that he wanted to re-engineer. You know, he had that, I don't know if you ever saw that map uh, where he would, how he would uh, repopulate the United States according to ethnic identity. And this, uh, and this seemed to be a place maybe here he was kicking the tires. I don't yeah, I mean, this was a, a map that was printed in his NAAWP newsletter. I mean, things that were surfaced by your group, Larry, um, the Louisiana Coalition Against Racism and Nazism that kind of came back to haunt him in some ways during these political races. And I'm sure in other ways, there were some voters who were probably liked Duke more because he had done these things yeah, I think so. in his past. But it was certainly a topic of, of interest and fascination on these things that um, had been printed in these newsletters. You know, uh, you, you mentioned that our group uh, surfaced. I, I need to give a huge shout out to Lance Hill because he was both the brains behind it, the energy, the vision. And he had compi been compiling a huge portfolio about Lance. So he was, I mean, excuse me, about David Duke. So he, you know, we were already primed because of his work and his commitment and basically his his, uh, you know, his genius uh, and to begin to deal with this threat. So I, I just wanted to make sure that, that his presence is acknowledged in all this. Yeah, and Lance was a major presence in the podcast and having his voice in our story, I think it wouldn't have had um, credibility or the same kind of authority without him and just the, the work that he did back then and the way he's able to actually articulate the the vision behind the anti-Duke movement again yeah. both then and now um, is really unparalleled. Yeah absolutely. 
Well, you know, this is not just about Duke. In fact, Duke's more of a foil, I think. I mean, he, because you want to understand where he came from and how he remade himself, the fraud that it was. It was just a mask, obviously. And in fact, I would argue that maybe the reason he became a Klansman was to try to Americanize Nazism. He thought this is a way to uh, disinfect Nazism. But um, that, of course, is what really came back to haunt him. But uh, so, you know, it's about this, his, his transformation and how that almost uh, put him in the governor in the U.S. Senate and the <clears throat> governor's mansion. But but it's as much and maybe even more so about how he was how he was met and how his threat was turned back. And I think that's probably where your show packs the most power, the most emotional and moral power. And, and maybe you'd like to talk about that. I think for both of you, uh, it clearly became very clear to me that this was um, this was partly the the beating heart that was propelling this story in a way that Duke was, was really not. He was just an excuse to tell a story about a, basically a moral drama because this was not a, this was not a political threat, it was a moral threat. And uh, I think what you both did was to recognize that and to pull the strings of that out of this story. And maybe you might want to say something about that aspect of it as well. Yeah, Christopher, do you want to go first on that one? Sure, I'll take a swing at it. Um, I mean, part of the answer is that that I, I worked on two seasons of Slow Burns, uh, season three and four, um, but I'm also a fan of the show. And that is, I think, baked into the Slow Burn style, um, which is that not that the, the sort of reason we're here is a ruse, but the idea that like we're telling a kind of we're telling a story that feels a little bit more um, sort of there's a not so much a moral story behind it, but that there is a drama that's unfolding kind of beneath the political story or with season three with a kind of cultural story. Um, and and that's always, you know, or at least in the seasons I worked on, that is our guiding light. And even as I listen to the show, that's sort of the guiding light of and the that, show. That's that's the big in two pack show. Season yeah, yeah, three, right? yeah, exactly. Great. That was very gripping. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, so, I mean, that that's generally it. Like, it's a kind of an understanding of every, I've worked on several different podcasts and like they all have their conceit and their structure and sort of what they're editing for, what you're organizing tape for and what you're writing towards. And, and I think that we knew, I, I correct me if I'm wrong here, Josh, but I think that we knew that if we were gonna tell a straight political story that there wasn't enough there. Um, and that that wasn't really the most compelling piece of this, um, that, that David Duke's sort of rise and fall and rise and fall came from somewhere, that it's rooted in something and that, right. and finding all of those different roots and tracking some of those down and running into dead ends and turning around and finding others and laying those out, hopefully, um, in a way that made sense and was enjoyable was really what we were after. I also just wanted to say something about real quick about um, your question about where we started. Um, Josh, I don't know if you remember all of these details, uh, but you know, one of the biggest challenges with making podcasts like this can be where do you start? And it may seem like an obvious choice when you hear the series, but it's not always easy. Um, there are lots of different arguments and we put plenty of them out in our editorial conversations and in our discussions about do we start in a linear fashion or do we start kind of in a particular moment and then go back um, and I just wanted to share that with folks who maybe are curious sort of what happens behind the curtain and the way that we talked about why we want to start with the place that we did and then work our way back to give a backstory um, mm -hmm. and that's that's hard that's a hard those are hard choices to make yeah I mean we started with the district 81 race, which was Duke's great victory. Neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, to show him kind of at the height of his powers, um, as it were, and to, to tell the story of how he became a political actor in the state. Like it seemed important to start there and to tell that story, but a different, you know, we could have Start, we could have done the thing chronologically, but one thing that Christopher and I talked about was 
how in a lot of ways this wasn't a story about David Duke the person like we're not we weren't setting out to do a biography of Duke um Tyler Bridges's book yeah. on Duke is amazing and, and indispensable um and we didn't want to do ex exactly what um Tyler had done um we wanted to tell a story tell you know kind of what you were alluding to Larry um kind of explain where Duke came from and where his ideas came from and the power of his ideas and why they took root with the people they did and also kind of how he was stopped to the extent that he was stopped. And all of that is a bigger story than just one person. And I think with any story that's um, worth telling, there's a kind of complexity to it around, um, are there, is, is this a story that makes you optimistic about America and about the world or is it a story that makes you pessimistic? And I think, at the end, I felt both things very strongly. And to the extent that I felt optimistic, it's for the reason that you cited in your question, Larry, it's that there were so many people that did stand up and so many different kinds of people and so many people that did something, whether it's small or large. Um, and that's just a really important aspect of this series is telling those stories and explaining where those people came from. But to my sense of it with both of you that this was, you're, you're coming at this story when you're barely out of adolescence or maybe you still are in adolescence. So this is, this is sort of on the surface of your memory. And this was, I think I got the sense that this was more, uh, this is more than about uh, uh, you know trying to brush up on history, you know, fill in the blanks. That this was a, a, an engagement on a very moral and personal level, and there's something. It, 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 if uh, if the, the listeners have a chance, I would urge you to subscribe to to Slate because you can then get access to these Slate Plus. Uh, interviews. It's mainly a conversation with Josh and Chris, Christopher, and uh, uh, and others. And uh, what came across to me, and what I also picked up from the, the the series itself, was the fact that you all were really grappling with something in a way that you didn't think you would grapple with it. But Christopher said something early on. And it was in a conversation about season three where Ad Levy and Beth Rickey, uh, the late and very lamented Beth Rickey, um, a, real, a real hero in all this. Uh, Christopher, you said you were, you were listening to these voices in your head. And at the same time, there's a Black Lives Matter march going outside your window. And that, that had almost had almost a kind of a transformative, maybe a transformative effect is too, too overloaded and overworked the word, but a, 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 a really profound effect. I mean, I, you could pick that up. Yeah, um, so I'm sure that our viewers recall that when we were working on this series, we were really getting really down into the nitty gritty of it last, um, summer, just as much of the world was seeing these protests um, against police violence. And this was triggered most immediately by the murder of George Floyd. Um, and there were protests everywhere, including in my old neighborhood in Bed Bed Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm down in my production session in the software, cutting tape, listening to Josh's the, the recording that he's done and all of the audio raw audio that we have archival tape and everything um and I'm listening to people talk about David Duke and reliving in some ways you know his his impact and reliving his life quite frankly um through through this audio while these protests are going on it's you know I, I don't know about anybody else but for me that intersection was a pretty in, intense one um, you know, it, it's like the, the sort of symbolism was right there 
in front of my face for me. And it also, what I will also add now that I've had some kind of time to think about it, is it, it made me feel, I don't want to overstate this, but it really did make me feel at the time um, also a sense of responsibility. Like there, there's a, um, there's a craftsmanship to what we do, um, you know, to, to tell a story in a way that's going to be, that's going to be informative, but also that you all are going to want to listen to and to consume and that it, it presented in a way that makes it digestible and compelling. And I felt that responsibility. I don't want to speak for Josh, but I suspect that he does as well, that like, it's telling the story, but it's also telling it in a way that's really going to be absorbed. And so that really helped me focus in that much more what I was doing. Like, we've got to get this out. We've got to get it told the right way. We really need people because to Because of the moment? This. Yeah, because of the moment, but also like it's the moment, but the moment is really a reflection of something much larger, right? The moment that, that folks were protesting wasn't unique to the summer of 2020. It's a reflection of a larger experience. Um, and so, you know, that we are contributing to the way that stories like that are told and experiences like that are translated because we have plenty of people in the series who um, are a reflection of those same communities that we're protesting. So, yeah. yeah. I would add a couple of things to that, which is um, I think the sense of responsibility we felt when taking on this topic and not wanting to do it the wrong way because Duke himself was a master manipulator of the media and used the media to fuel his rise in a lot of ways. And so two things, number one, if you're critiquing the media, then you're putting your, you're leaving yourself open to critiques fairly enough. And so we wanted to, I think, be really thoughtful and careful about what we were doing. But we also just didn't want to have this be a kind of platform for David Duke to be resurgent and to have like another kind of moment in the sun. Well, like, let me, what this let me rephrase, I mean, was, was, I mean, was, the, why now? Why would you do this, this series now? I mean, this, this was, a, we're, we're living through a pretty, I think uh, the other day we were talking, Chris, or you mentioned existential crisis. I don't think that's that's overstating it. Not just the pandemic, but the whole political moment that we've li been living through. And, and, and does that have any bearing on your your decision to make this powerful series at the time you did? Or am I reading something into it that's not there? No, I think you're... I think you're onto something. Um, and I would say that it would be too simple to say that it's a commentary on the present. I think it's a commentary on America. It's a commentary on American history and a pattern that's recurred that came before Duke and came after Duke um, and will happen, I think, sadly, after we're gone. And to try to understand um, that for myself and maybe in that understanding, maybe help explain it to others so that they can identify the pattern and see where it comes from and, and get a sense of its appeal, that does seem valuable. But, you know, we're talking about, we're, I'm talking about Louisiana today in part. And for me, getting back to kind of our, our earlier discussion, was an effort for me to try to understand the Louisiana-ness of this and to try to understand this place where I grew up and where my family is and from. your place in it? Before me. What's that? And your place in it? Yeah, and my place in it and wondering where I, where I fit in and why. You know, I asked this question at the end of our fourth episode to Michelle Bell Boissier, who's a professor at Xavier in New Orleans and who was living through all of this and whose family has been in Louisiana for generations, um, I asked her, how do you think about the fact that so many people in this state that you lived in then and that you live in now voted for this man or felt drawn to this man? And she gave an answer that I found both really moving and also kind of helped something click into place for me 
And she said, you know, what I do is that I do work, you know, I find power and meaning in the work that I do of being at this predominantly black institution and teaching, you know, biology and educating people to have careers that people like David Duke think they might not be capable of having. And I find, you know, power and meaning in that. And so the, the thought of like, I had maybe thought of it too much in a passive way. It's like, how do you live and how do you think about this? And what she was kind of teaching me and maybe what I learned from other people as well is like, the way you live with it is to be active, is to be doing things, is to be doing work and not to just be sitting there and hoping the world is gonna change and is gonna become a place that is more comfortable for you. I, I would also add that like, you know, I think it's in the last episode where Josh basically kind of gives this summary. I think it's in the last episode. Um, is that with Norman all Robinson? The, uh, I think so. Yes. Yeah, it's in, the, yeah. It's, in the, it's in that episode. Yeah. yeah, where like you add up several of the choices that we've seen people make over the course of um, the season. Um, that it's not necessarily one individual choice um, that stops David Duke at a certain point, but that it's different people across time in all of these different places geographically and politically um, making decisions. And, you know, it's, it, for me, one of the thing that, one of the things that makes the series, I think also powerful is that it shows that these things don't just happen out of the sky, that, 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 that that these kinds of moments like the rise of David Duke happen because of sets of choices and in individual choices that add up. It just like individual decisions to you know, tap him on the shoulder and say something to him that then explodes into something larger and helps feed a movement. These are individual choices of courage. Um, and and, and Lancel had a really powerful thing that he said about that, Christopher, about the kind of horizontality of this and the person to personness of it and just how much more effective it is when we talk to each other about what we believe and what we feel as opposed to having someone you know from on high telling us what to think and what to believe right and just the right. kind of intimacy yeah of that neighbor to neighbor sort of thing and how that really powered powered this movement and that's, that's as true then as it is now. So you were asking, Larry, why do this now? I think that that's another kind of powerful piece of the series is this sort of showing choices that are made in a certain direction, you know, that, that really can add up um, to send a rocket up and also bring it down. And that are essential to uh, achieving and maintaining democratic decency and uh, civility too, a kind of engaged citizenry by individuals. And you, I guess you were referring to Ann Levy, that tap on the shoulder. I was, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I do remember something you said about how you, you, you kind of felt that moment, you not hear it, you actually felt that moment. And you said it was almost like a superhero putting his sword up in the sky and then receiving the power, you know, that, yeah, you can do this he man, yeah. sort of thing, yeah. Because it was transformative for her, obviously. And, and for, for uh, Beth Rickey, another, another person who was a real hero that stepped forward in a way that probably costed her both her career and her life, to tell you the truth. There is a kind of urgency also in telling this story now because you know, Beth is, is gone, she died uh, many years ago now, but we interviewed John Treen and he died of COVID not long after we talked to him. Buddy Romer just died. Um, Anne Levy, her voice is still strong and powerful and carries a long, a, a long distance, but how many Holocaust survivors are there left who can speak, um, you know, a, as Anne can? Like, we shouldn't, wait on telling these stories. We should tell them while we can and while the people who did these, these things are still around to speak to them. But you know, you were also telling another story that I, because I did sense this kind of virtual intimacy in which you and your team were working, that there was a conversation going on about race 
you know, between you and, and Josh, Trista uh, and Josh, as well as I think you brought on Clint Smith and uh, uh, Van Newkirk of the Atlantic. Van yeah. Newkirk of the Atlantic. Yeah, another really, really strong young black uh, black voice. And that that am I, am I reading too much into that? But I did get a sense that this brought out a kind of explicitness in a conversation that maybe otherwise might not have reached that, you know, that plateau. It's again, speaking to the moment in which this show was put together and, uh, and the, I mean, the incredible conditions that you were, you were doing it. I mean, you're all under house arrest, COVID house arrest and, uh, uh, and you're not doing face to face, but you get a sense that was even a more powerful uh, engagement because of that than it would have been had you all been in the same room, just you know, business as usual. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I was so interested to learn about um, from the late 80s and early 90s were these debates going on among Jewish leaders and Black leaders about what our voices actually, um, would it backfire if we speak out? Um, do people actually want to hear from us? Oh, or could um, you know, Duke use the fact that he was being quote unquote attacked? Um, could he use that to murder himself and actually gain sympathy? And as a, um, a Jewish person speaking for myself and you know, Christopher can speak for himself as a black man kind of working on this show, um, that collaboration was extremely meaningful to me, um, but also it just felt like this and in so many other ways, like we were kind of going down a path that other people had gone down before we had, which is like very kind of inspiring in a lot of ways, um, but also, I don't know, it, I guess it's not, in some ways comforting to know that people had dealt with the same kinds of decisions that you were making, but there's also, again, this sense of history repeating, history repeating itself and this being just a very kind of recurring American phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I remember the conversations that Josh and I would have, sometimes even down to certain lines in scripts about how we turn up or turn down emphasis here or there. And this is where I kind of come in as someone who's, I'm, I'm black and I'm also not from the area. And so like, for me, the story of David Duke was one that was pretty, you know, two dimensional for me. David Duke is a white supremacist. He's a Klansman, like it was that piece of it. I knew about his Nazi, his like the sort of neo-Nazi stuff. I knew that stuff, but for me, it was the, the clan piece that really locked in for me. And so like us talking through both, you know, it's not an either or and talking through how we hold both of those in the frame and do justice to both of those pieces um, of, of his career. And also to our audience, again, like listening and taking all of this in, how we turn up and turn down the volume on different parts of the story. That was really interesting to me. And I will say also, it's like, as colleagues, it, in, a, in a moment like that, I sort of take ourselves back to this moment back in you know March, April, May, last summer, when we were in this very different existential state in this country. And so having a chance to really connect with my colleague in this really intense way was actually kind of nice. Um, to talk through these very, very heavy things with, with Josh, who's extremely thoughtful and skilled at translating a lot of this material was really wonderful to me, even though the material is not so great. The process was so gratifying, I thought, anyway. Um, yeah, I, I definitely felt the same. And just to speak about podcasting as a medium, it's very intimate. Um, as a listener, when you're on the listener side, to have people, um, you know, especially if you're wearing headphones, just like have these voices in your head. It's um, in many ways more 
intimate in that way than video um, because you're able to really kind of build this world in your mind and um, you know it's it's a kind of technical thing but to speak about Beth Ricky again for a minute we had really high quality audio of Beth from you know radio documentary um, maker named Gary Cavino also from a the fantastic Louisiana journalist Plato Robinson. Um, and to have Beth's voice in that kind of crystalline way for me, but I think also for the listener, it just, she felt so present. Right. And, um, you know, and to have, you know, Christopher would be on in my ears when we were tracking the episodes, when I was tracking my narration. And so like, and I had set up this studio in the closet in my house. And so it's like me and Christopher, like he's in my ears and we're, you know, talking about our scripts and how to, you know, say a particular line. And that's like an incredibly intimate kind of, we're the only people in that world then. And so there's just like intimacy, 360 degrees of, of intimacy. It's, it's incredible. Now, how many hours of tape did you compile? Did you, I mean, you, you have probably had a, you know, a gracious plenty of voices and sound, I guess, to pick and choose from. Yeah, I mean, I'll let Christopher um, do the bulk of this, but just to give a little bit of background for people, um, the different categories of, of tape that we have is original interviews, like we did one with you, Larry, um, and we had dozens upon dozens of those that were our questions and their answers to us and, um, you know, tape that we incorporated that way. We also have archival interviews, like the ones with Beth and with other people that we were able to draw on. And then whether it's um, documentaries or news stories, things that we put in the broad category of archive. And so, you know, Christopher, if you want to jump in and talk about how we sifted through that and how we kind of decided what to include, but there's, even before we get to the number of hours, there's a whole number of categories of types of thing that one can include in a, a narrative history podcast. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that that's right. I, I would have to totally guess now, but I would say at least a couple hundred hours. Um, of, of tape, um, like Josh said, dozens of interviews, and each of those interviews, um, Larry, you, you can testify to this, you know, can go for a couple of hours. Um, and, and then there's follow-ups sometimes with, with, our, with our subjects, um, and troves of stuff that we got from a couple of different archival sources, which was really wonderful. All of the newsreel tape that, um, and it, this wasn't, we, there's was a couple of producers here who I just, I gotta give a shout out to, we've mentioned a couple of times, Madeline Ducharme and Sophie Summergrad, who are both producers on this series. Sophie is still working with Slow Burn. She's fantastic. Madeline is fantastic. Um, sifted through a lot of this tape um, with me and Josh. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's both like, it's the diversity of tape and it's also figuring out where all of that goes and how you want to kind of prioritize which voice and which section of the series. Um, and, and then tr tr like tracking all, wh where's that tape from? Can we confirm the date on that? Does this happen before this moment? You know what I mean? So it's like all of this organizing and just very, very quickly, we, we worked through a couple of different um, organizing systems. A lot of it was through just sort of online Google drives and such, um, but also a couple of other different platforms. And we had to coordinate who was going through what, a kind of divide and conquer, and then tracking all of that, tracking all of our sources through spreadsheets, with phone numbers. And then there's you know tons of people that we Tr I tried to track down and for whatever reason we weren't able to reach. There's several different kind of sub stories. If you listen to the series, you'll hear these sort of sub stories inside of the larger story. There are a couple of those roads that we went down and each of those roads, sometimes half a dozen, a dozen people that we reached out to maybe with a half hour of tape here, an hour of tape there that we end up not using. This is very much part of the process, but it is, it's a big process to sort of distill so this is all not this a weekend. 
crash course kind of thing. <laughs> Not even close. Uh, and it all, you know, I just have to say, like, it all kind of, I know that Josh um, relies very much on all of us and our editorial team, um, Gabe Roth and Rowan Liu, fantastic editors on our show, but it really all does go through Josh. Like, ultimately, Josh has to sort all of that and make it make sense into a story. Um, we're all just, you know, working for you. Uh, I would well, say that I think just, it's an incredibly collaborative yeah. process, and yeah. I, with with writing a piece with with text, that can be very solo and and isolating. Um, even though there are a lot of people that go into the finished product there, but this is like team work every step of the way, and so it's really gratifying for all of us. I well, think you, did, you did a splendid job. And I think it's my job now to uh, turn it over to the Q&A. And we have at least five or more six questions. The first one is from Mimi Schlesinger. Uh, and she asks, do any of you feel that a rise in David Duke's popularity <clears throat> or someone of his beliefs or personality could gain support in Louisiana? I think never say never um and you know one of the things that i learned in doing this work and in doing this um podcast is that you need to understand what came before you to understand what could happen in the future and the like very simplistic way to put it is that when things are going bad um, or when people feel marginalized or threatened or at risk then demagoguery is a highly successful political strategy. And a lot of the work that David Duke did was on the one hand, kind of trying to build this white identity and get people to think of themselves as white, first and foremost, beyond any other way that they could categorize themselves. But also to tell people to the extent that you're having any kind of problems in your life, they're not of your doing there are other people's doing and that kind of blame shifting um, and saying, it's not your fault, I'm brave and I'm the only one telling the truth about whose fault it really is. And it wasn't even so much, I mean, I don't know if what you would say to this Larry, but it felt like for Duke, the job was mostly just to say that there wasn't as much of a promise of like how he was gonna fix it. I mean. He would. Well, he was. He was. He, his, his agenda was to build a white consciousness movement. I think. But so people, yeah, people don't even yeah. need. Yeah. I don't feel like a promise of like I'm going to do X, Y, or Z to make your life better. It's. It was more just like nobody else is saying this. I'm the brave person who's going to put my finger on it, and that was enough in a lot of cases. And, and, that and I'll. And, and I'll. Uh, and unlike. Other these other uh, uh, politicians, I'll actually deliver on my threats. That's I think part of its appeal. But none of that seems specific to a time, or even specific to a place. Like whether it could happen in Louisiana, I think that's like a very important question for those of us who you know care about the place or grew up there or live there to think about. But I think, and we've talked about this too, Larry. There was for people that were outside of the state at the time, kind of took, um, I think, un <laughs> unfair comfort in the fact that this was, this was happening in Louisiana and saying, oh, it's just those kooks down there and this couldn't happen nationally or where I'm from. And so I think everybody needs to be asking themselves this question, not just um, let, let me jump ahead to a question that just came up and I'll go back, circle back and, and bring the other questions in. This is from Dino Sater, who's uh, 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 he actually worked with us on the uh, on the Stop David Duke 
a campaign. And he says a poll one week before the 1990 U.S. Senate race had Duke at 26%. On election day, he got 44%. What happened and what are the implications for present and future elections against extreme right wing candidates? Um, well, so it's, we it's, spoke to Susan Howell about that. She um, is a voice in the fourth episode of our series that gets into the U.S. Right. Senate race. And she talked about this phenomenon of the shy Duke voter and how um, the way that she ultimately figured out how to get a little bit closer to having a handle on Duke support is by asking questions like, do you support a Martin Luther King holiday? And things that would um, give maybe a little bit better handle on racial attitudes and for people who might not trust pollsters or might not want to let their um, Duke allegiance be known. And so in a kind of narrow sense, I think that provides one answer. But I mean, the question of, of polling and politics is an extremely broad and thorny ones with a lot of um, people who are uh, smarter than I am have thoughts about it, but um, with with Duke specifically, there was th this kind of like two things going on at once. Like you had, I mean, one of the things that I remember from my childhood very vividly are the really big blue and white Duke signs and seeing those, um, you know, not far from where I lived in New Orleans. And so, and, and you know, we talked also in the series about people buying Duke merch and the, bumper stickers and the shirts and all that. And so there were a lot of people that were not particularly ashamed of being, you know, loud and proud with their Duke support. But I think, you know, maybe particularly like in places like Uptown New Orleans, or there, there was another group of people that I think recognized the social stigma that might be attached to supporting Duke publicly, um, and nevertheless, you know, in the well, here, here's a question <laughs> related to uh, something you just said from an anonymous attendee. It says, "Can you tell us about the response you received from people in Louisiana? What kind of reception Slow Burn Season Four received here?" It got a lot of really good um, notice and attention. I mean. <clears throat> Good opportunity to thank the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities for um, for giving us this great honor. And um, I think I did not get personally a lot of kind of negative response or blowback from people in Louisiana or elsewhere, except maybe in the realm of like anonymous iTunes comments. Um, or anonymously sent emails. I think um, it was more of a challenge for us, and this maybe gets back to the polling question too, to get people on our show to come on and say, I supported David Duke. Um, and I think we're probably not gonna hear from that many people, I mean, Christopher, did you hear from anyone who was like, I supported David Duke and I think either positively or negatively about your podcast? I mean, people I think are, are not coming out and, and owning that. No, I mean, all actually all that I remember is something that's only sort of tangentially related, which is people who have heard the podcast kind of like sharing their interactions with David Duke, just r random people. Uh, seemingly random, who are telling us stories about having interacted with him in all these different parts of the world, um, you know, in this era that the podcast frames, but also since then. Yeah, and so there's a whole huge number of people walking around and moving through the world who voted for the guy and who supported the guy, like hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people. And it was about 600,000 who voted for him in the governor's election, white people. Well, there may, may have been a few blacks, but 
Yeah, and so that, that, that's quite a number. To the extent that those folks are listening, they haven't made themselves known as a group to me, but I think I'm I'm curious for your thoughts on this, Larry, as a kind of keen political observer, but um, there's a way in which Duke is a kind of convenient bright line that was drawn then and continues to be drawn now. I'm mean, like, oh yeah, that guy went way too far and I would never kind of sign on with him. I think for a lot of Republicans, for a lot of Democrats, um, to just kind of put him in a kind of separate category as someone who like, oh yeah, like that was some, that was like a, a crazy thing that happened. But um, when you look at, again, the number of people that voted for him, the percentages that he pulled in these races, it wasn't like a fringe thing, no. like the bright line that people imagine. It wasn't, it wasn't really there. Well, he certainly gave, uh... Pat Buchanan, uh, an idea that it was time for him to get involved in national politics. And uh, he said, that dude is stealing from me. I'm going to come down there and sue him for intellectual larceny or something like that, intellectual theft. And that's when he launched his, his insurgent campaign. So clearly, uh, Duke did something to release this, uh, uh, this virus into our politics. And you could see it down here at that time. You know, the Buddy Romer just got elected. All the talk was about fiscal reform, tax reform, you know, good government. Duke burst on the scene, and then all we're talking about is race. So we're talking about welfare queens. We're talking about uh, 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 I'm trying to think of a word. Um, uh, we're talking about affirmative action. Among no, all affirmative the action. But I mean, they, they want it, it, it. His idea is all problems have a biological solution. So he wanted to, you know, when you. When you what do you do when you want, you want to keep somebody from getting pregnant? I don't know why I'm having a brain freeze on Nor, that word. Norplant? Norplant, yeah, but it's, what does that do? It's, uh, it's sterilization. Like, Enforced sterilization, yeah. Sterilization, yeah, I'm no, sorry. Uh, but you yeah, that was all that, that was a whole conversation all of a sudden. And then every, it's a kind of, uh, of course, law and order, but it's all welfare and how blacks and uh, the black poor welfare cheats are bankrupting the uh, United States. And of course you wrote about this in American Queen, but, but it really, he, he's really, he's a, he's a stone Nazi. He believes that social problems have biological solutions. Mm -hmm. And he you, believed that for a long time. He still we does. Had, we had you in our series telling the story of you, Larry, watching him, um, you know, when he was in the state house with like a letter opener opening this mail. It's opening cash and check. Well, Beth, and, Beth, Ricky and I went into the chamber and watched him. And it was like, and all the, uh, you could see all the heads swivel by the, by other, uh, by other state legislatures. Cause they said, gee, this guy's really catching on. The next thing you know, he had really pretty much captured the Republican party at, at many levels. Yeah, and, and they so the kowtow thing. to him, and you know, there's a this there's, there's a question that, and I'd like to get up, get to more of them. I don't know if we're going to get to all of them. Uh, do you see Duke as a symptom or a cause? Did he pave the way for the seeming resurgence of white nationalism, or was he simply an early prominent voice? Uh, I guess historians are going to have to sort that out, but I do think uh, he was a, um, you know, he was kind of a stormy petrol. He was a kind of a, a, a harbinger, a warning a canary in the, the mine shaft about how our politics are, are not uh, simply because we have strong institutions like we, we think they do, but it's still, it's still possible to breach those guardrails. And I think we've seen that recently. You know, yeah, that, I mean, if you ask the white nationalists themselves, they would tell you that David Duke was important. So that gives you one kind of answer. Um, you mentioned the conversations that we had um, as additions to the series in Slate Plus. One of them we had was with Eli Saslow, who wrote this book with Derek Black, who um, had- Godson you know, of David Duke. 
the, the godson of David Duke and the son of Don Black, who was right. Duke's main clan ally. Mar and married Duke. Duke's ex-wife. <laughs> yeah, very, very intimately all, all tied up together. Yeah. And Derek left white supremacy, but was very kind of close and connected to all of this. And um, so, you know, one of the things that we talked about in that conversation was Duke is is such a is kind of marginal figure now. If he himself personally is a bit off the map, then um, you know to what extent is his story important? And I think it is in the way that it provided both the kind of intellectual support and underpinnings for the modern white nationalist movement, but also you know Christopher in the way that he provided a kind of both a template, but also a kind of inspiration, I think, to the degree that he had success. He showed you could establish a beachhead in mainstream politics. Part. First time it happened. You know, if our uh, stone Nazi was able to pull that off. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time, and I, I'm really sorry we, we didn't leave enough time to get to all the questions and observations. Um, but here's a uh, here's a uh, a question about uh, it's a good ending question. Has David Duke reached out to any of you in an attempt to engage in a discussion regarding the podcast? So he spoke to Tyler Bridges, who um, is his biographer and who wrote about him contemporaneously for the Times Picayune and has known Duke and followed him for decades. And Tyler wrote a piece um, last year on the occasion, I believe it was of Duke Did getting Blitico? banned from YouTube. So oh. right around the time that we started doing our show, there was this conversation about platforms and um, you know the, the kinds of voices on these platforms and Duke got banned from YouTube and Twitter, right? I think after our show started coming on, um, you know, go, getting be, becoming available online. And so Tyler asked Duke about it, and he said, you know, that the show was full of lies and, um, you know, whatever whatever it is that he said. So his response to our show came via, um, you know, his, Tyler Bridges's question, but we decided and and we explained it on the site and in the podcast um, that we were gonna feature Duke's words in archival material and we were gonna represent his views fairly and accurately, but that we weren't gonna interview him ourselves. Um, in and and it just turned out that this happened to be happening in parallel with these conversations that places like YouTube and Twitter were having about um, giving white supremacy and white nationalism a platform. And so for folks that are interested in a longer kind of explanation of, of our decision there, and Christopher and I and others had a huge number of conversations about this and how we wanted to do it, um, you can find those in the pod, find that in the podcast. Yeah, and we talk about this in the, it was planned to be a kind of interlude episode, but it ended up becoming a sort of fuller episode it's the would essentially be fourth in the series between episodes um three so and, three and a half three and a half exactly uh called cold call in which you know josh you i think very elegantly um and pretty sort of quickly move through your thinking about why at the end of the day we chose not to interview him um, and talk to him for the show and you know i won't you know, speak for you, you put it really, really well, but basically this idea that, you know, that's that's not what we're here for. We, we've learned and we continue to learn through the rest of the series how David Duke uses platforms like this yeah. one. And that's not what we are here to do. We're here to tell a different kind of story. Not, it wasn't interested in dialogue as a, right. kind of a platform or megaphone for its own views. Right. Well, I think we've reached that point where I have to turn this back over to Aaron. And uh, thank you very much for being with us.
I want to thank all of you for participating. This was a really rich conversation, I think an important and timely conversation. And Christopher, I appreciate you really underscoring that David Duke was was not entirely an anomaly. You know, he is part of a long trajectory of um, white supremacist behaviors and um, actions that have taken place in, in the United States. And I really appreciate the way that you guys so sensitively and carefully um, underscored that. Uh, I want to thank Larry for joining us as moderator. You're a wonderful moderator. It's always good to have you in this role. And I want to thank everybody who joined us today to um, watch and listen to the very first episode of our Bright Lights online series. If you haven't seen or if you haven't heard, I suppose that's what podcasts are, they're for your ears. If you haven't heard the Slate podcast, Slow Burn season four on David Duke, um, I really encourage you to um, check it out. It, it's, a, it's kind of like brain candy for your ears. Um, maybe candy is not the right word because it's, it's not sweet, but please check it out. And we hope you'll join us again next Friday at 11 o'clock for our second iteration of Bright Lights Online. Um, we'll be in conversation with our champion of culture, Carol Bebel from Ashe Cultural Arts Center and New Orleans poet, Kelly Harris DeBerry. You can register for that and all future Bright Lights Online programs at the LEH. See you soon. Aaron, Thanks everybody. Aaron, Aaron can I make yeah. one last plug for Slate Plus? It, it's an yes, annual subscription. But the, you know, the, uh, the plus episodes, I think there are three or four of them are as, as rich and as interesting and compelling as the, as the episodes themselves or commentary behind the scenes, behind the screen. So, you know, uh, I would do that. Yeah, Thank check you. out the bonus content and it's another way to support the work yeah. um, being done by, by Slate and folks like Christopher and Josh. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. It. Bye.